something I just experienced today. I, mean, I, have to, I don't know which was, um, which was the more impressive bit of acting, the fact that you looked genuinely surprised when he came round in that car, as if you weren't expecting him to be there. It's called acting, though. <laughs> <laughs> or that you say you have to be on the same stage as John Levine. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, it, it, it wasn't, uh, Bessie blew up twice, I just have to share that with you. Um, so the outtakes were really good, and I looked at Stuart at one point, and I said, I think that's John having a go at your driving. Because <laughs> John was very, very possessive about Bessie. Um, and in terms of just watching it on, on the sofa with um, um, Richard and, oh, and John... It was like a tennis match. I mean, <laughs> you know, because there was a couple of episodes that they weren't in. And so you can't sort of sit there and ignore. So I'm kind of trying to watch it, keep going, because I haven't seen these things basically since we did them. Because even when we do the, what do they call it when you sit and talk about it on audio? What do they call that? Commentary. Thank you. Um, you know, it's been a long night, you know. I had I was at a big party. Um, anyway, um, so there was all this. And then, of course, you saw Richard. You were sort of... I don't know, he went off onto another planet for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and, then was, and, and I was like this, the whole way. I was just going are, they, are they both quite competitive in their own way? Or? Um, <laughs> well, I think perhaps in days gone by, you know, um, there was a, a healthy sort of competition. And, and, and when you said at the start, you know, we, we're such good friends, we all kind of got on so well on set. Oh, know, that's true. That, 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 that no, no, true. no, that's true. That, that stands to this day. I mean, there, there isn't one single person in our group, um, sadly, we're, we're the last three standing, yeah. um, but there, there's a huge bond between John Levine and myself and Richard and myself. In fact, I'm sort of making sure now that Richard gets to gigs and I look up train times and all that kind of thing. I, I'm going to be matron, darling. Um, and it's such a joy, and I've had a very, very long, close relationship with John Levine. Um, you know, through all sorts of different things, but you never lose that um, wonderful, faithful friend. And we, we share a lot of our private lives, and you know, they've always, we've always kept that, and that, that makes it very much a strong friendship. And the other thing that's obviously really, really clear from all three of you is... is, is how much you love to work with John Pertwee and how much you love John Pertwee. And that really comes across as well, doesn't it? Our leader, absolutely. Well, he, you know, he did. He led that team so well. Um, and, of course, only for the first year did we have constant working with, with um, wonderful Nick Courtney um, and obviously working with, in UNIT. Um, but he always was right there for absolutely everybody. He was always very welcoming. And if John wasn't in great shape for one reason or another, of course, I was, I was little Nurse Manning. You know, we, we all looked to each other all the time. We laughed a lot, but we worked hard. And as John always, you know, one of the things about Doctor Who that I think is really, really important, um, especially back then, was the seriousness with which you take this show. You know, Doctor Who is a very serious business, but there was always room for a spoonful of humour. And, and, and there was a genuine chemistry between you and him. I mean, oh, you could tell how well you got on, on and off screen. I mean, we, we never had lunch without each other. We, you know, literally did everything together. We always drove to um, the wherever we were filming together, and then he picked me up outside. I had a flower shop. Um, called Hay Fever, um, <laughs> and uh, so he used to pick me up on that sort of corner, and I'll never forget the very last day when um, we'd finished doing The Green Death. Well, it was the most emotional, I cannot tell you, as, as Michael Bryant said, everybody in the, up in the box, there was tears, it was just the most ridiculously teary ending, and which is why it sort of worked with no words. Anyway, the next day, it was the saddest thing, and I get, I get a little tear in my eye when I think about it. I went downstairs and stood outside the flower shop. You know, it was that, I'd been doing that for so long, and John had taught me so much. He was such a, a great mentor. And I learned so much about, for me, what was a new business. And so I learned all about the footprint, which is what we're seeing here. 
you know, I learned about the footprint that took us from um, from from doing sort of a music hall and all the things that radio that John had done. And so I was able to start learning the history of this wonderful business that I've been blessed to be in for over 50 years now. <laughs> you may not agree. <laughs> And he taught me the love and the respect and the understanding and the discipline that you have to have in this business. You know, he was absolutely amazing. And I was thinking, just watching that, you know, we're, we're laughing, I think, with great affection and warmth for, you know, when we do giggle at it. It's, it I think it's a giggling of love, like that, not love, oh, really. <laughs> and, you know, as I say, we do have to remember that we weren't able to compare it with anything else back then. And I look at these early days of Doctor Who, and it came to me on a bus, as everything does, <laughs> darling. I <laughs> my life on a bus. Um, and the, this, the very, very beginning, which is where I discovered Doctor Who with William Hartnell, it was like a little, a little seed that grew into a sapling. And then that sapling started to grow into a tree. And then coming right back and, and to what we have now, this wonderful, wonderful tree with all the branches that came off it. So what you're looking at is the actual birth of this extraordinary show. Um, and, you know, you may not have the technology that you have now, but it still has that unstoppable love and magic and you can see it all the way through. And, and at the start of um, season 10, did you know that would be your last season? Was that your decision or was it a decision that was made for you? No, it was... I mean, this was only I mean, my... Three years is a good run. In, by, by the oh, yeah. yeah. Um, it was only my second job as work. Um, and I thought that it was time to really start to see where else I could go or if I was going to go anywhere, but, you know, I had been bitten by the bug. I didn't want to do anything else ever. Um, and I talked to John about it and talked to everybody. And then I thought, also, as a, a viewer, you always think, if you keep the same person too long in dying, um, <laughs> if you keep the same, it doesn't give the, the, the doctor a chance to explore other aspects of his relationship. So I think it's I think it's very important to change the companion. That must have still been difficult to know that John was going to continue and you weren't going to be there. Well, John wasn't happy. I mean, he left a year later. Um, we had found a very, very strong, you know, friendship and, you know, working relationship. And I think... You know, with Liz, I think Liz, beautiful, beautiful Liz, found her strength in her relationship with Tom Baker. And I think John was, you know, getting uncomfortable for all sorts of different reasons. And, you know, sometimes when things do break up and the changes come about, you know. But I think it was the right decision to actually leave at that point. And what a wonderful story to be given. And it's a great story because it's given her a wonderful future. You know, Joe Jones. I'm planning the Daleks. Obviously, you'd already had an encounter with the Daleks previously, with um, with their Daleks. So they went. They went. Um, you know, My favourite. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, when when. Um, Sorry, I always, a... I always think of those Daleks, right? <laughs> it's like they're going round the old people's home. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's a home for retired Daleks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I always get that. It makes me cry. I love that. It's so terrible. This has been changed, I hear. I mean, you, talk, you, you talk about the fact that there's a lot of fans there. I mean, were the moments where you, did, you, know, what you were corpsing a lot? Did you have to just no, 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 we didn't corpse a lot. No, no, truly. You, you I guess you, it's, it's, a very, it's a very quick turnaround. I mean, I know there are, you know, performers that do that. <coughs> John ran a very serious, we ran a very serious show. You know, when we were in that studio, we were there, I mean, we are spying in rehearsals, we did all sorts of little naughty things in rehearsals. Um, but once you get into the studio, we have no time. Come 10 o'clock, bang, sprinklers on, lights out, bada bing, bada boom, we're going home. You know, so there was never any leeway. 
And it was much more complex because of the different effects that were trying to be achieved in the studio. So you can't have actors messing around when you're against time. You really can't. And, and one thing that um, it, it, a lot of the actors are very used to, obviously, is acting against green screen because CGI comes later, but the version is fake. But you actually were acting against... I was an experiment! An but you were, you know, you, there's visual effects in this, and there's obviously an invisible monster as well. So you were having to... Well, yeah, but the weird thing is that they were experimenting on me. They did, we did green screens, blue screens, yellow screens. That was good. I lost my hair. Um, <laughs> but, so, but that was... We did a lot of that was being done, you know. Having to, so, and what would they do? Would they have like a, like now, with the <coughs> language I mean, would they have something you to kind of react against? How would well, that work? yes, you see, but <coughs> the one thing they didn't take into account, when we were experimenting, I had my glasses on. <coughs> but there's a little tiny monitor, which you are then to watch, so that you can follow the action of what's happening to you, right? So... My glasses were always taken away from me just before we did a take. So, of course, they, the glasses were taken away. And suddenly, I, I can't see that monitor. And so I had to, in my head, I had to know, I had to have count numbers, I had to react, I had to kind of almost learn a routine very, very quickly to be able to deal with the um, strawberry jam being poured all over me. <laughs> and, when you, and when you were on location, you came off after that film and had your hair cut, to then start filming the stuff in the studio, is that right? No, not that one. That happened a lot, but that was just that it was so wet on filming. Right? It does look different, doesn't it? Oh, completely different. My hair always looked different because it was so wet on filming as wet with it, which was its normal thing. And then, of course, they got the studio and nobody thought about it, and they were just curling my hair. So John's sitting there in rollers. <laughs> <laughs> And that was my fault, because I did suggest that maybe he had a bald spot. <laughs> and John was, um, you know, very, very um, keen on his appearance. So he told me he had a little bald spot. So if you notice through John's reign as Doctor Who, his hair gets bigger and curlier. <laughs> because the moment I told him that, of course, in went the Carmen Rollins. <laughs> Um, the story before this, Frontier in Space, um, dismissed horribly by uh, Patrick Mulcahy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it featured um, um, very prominently Roger Delgado, who you, who you sort of refer to. Oh, the master of masters, I call him. I mean, I have two favourites for what it's worth. And obviously, Roger Delgado, because I think he was the, the quintessential master, if you like. Um, but I love Missy. Mm. And I think, yeah, um, you know, going from one to, and I think too, isn't it interesting that they, they're both Spanish? If you think about it, um, Michelle Gomez and Roger Delgado, and if you look at them, there could, there is a sort of family resemblance there. But um, because she has that same quality, that sort of slight naughtiness, but I always think that you can't be menacing if you're, you know. If I'm sort of there and I'm really angry with you and I'm doing all this and blah, 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 right? I'm not scary. <laughs> but if I just happen to um, I'm scared now. <laughs> get a little closer, Very scared. <laughs> and so you should be. <laughs> and so if I just get here and I just look at you. Really <laughs> and I say, Justin, <laughs> start counting the days. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know. I hope so. I think she's fabulous. You could be you. What, me? Is me? Yeah. Oh, you can just uh, not turn into Irish wild time. <laughs> <laughs> She can be very bloody singer. <laughs> so, going back to the Planet um, of the Daleks, I mean, really, so these were just people in the little sort of casings, and they, are they kind of being pushed around by other people? I mean, that, how, how, how did they sort of manoeuvre themselves around the set of the Daleks? Were they in there sort of, or did they sort of wield themselves? I love the questions you ask me, because uh, there was a, inside, of course, we had John Scott Martin, 
And if you took the, the, the lid off a Dalek, is it? But if you take the top of the Dalek, there would be John Scott Martin inside, complete with his Times crossword, <laughs> um, and a sandwich, <laughs> and a flask, and then the little feet. Oh, I can't just, I have to do everything. Right? <laughs> so they're in there, and the little feet, so it's like that. Um, which, Is that high tech? That wasn't the best performance I've ever done, but you know, it's more like you do with a chair in the moment. Um, and so they were sort of shuffling along in their little blimp soles. Um, <laughs> it's very so bizarre, isn't it? It's so bizarre. And, yet, and they would be in rehearsals. And, of course, they'd just be sitting in the bottom half doing this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'm so glad that I, it, 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 was, it was wonderful. And they, were, they took their job once again very soon. And did you notice on the gold one, we only had one gold Dalek, um, and... If you look very carefully, if you when you see it, if you see it again, they, those were jam jars on the gold Dalek, <laughs> upside down. You see, you had to be. The less you have, the more creative you have to be. You know, if you go to the fridge and you've got a bit of mouldy cheese and a scrap of bread, you've got to get very creative. <laughs> and how do that? <laughs> so sorry. Um, <laughs> I, know. I, I know it's one of those. Like, <laughs> 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 um, but they so sorry. <laughs> I get so distracted. What's the technical stuff at the moment? You know that you, you, as I say, we had all the time. Everybody was thinking on their feet. And you'd see, you know, lovely Brian Hodgson would come in and he'd have bags under his eyes. He'd been up all night just trying to get a sort of ear, ear sound. Um, and it, 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 we, we all loved so passionately working on everything and learning every aspect of what went into making Doctor Who. It was a passion for me. You know, I was always either in the editing room or I, I was with the special effects or I was with Dudley Simpson. You know, it was so interesting and so, um, it was just so inspiring, the amount of creativity going on were you, around you. Were you a good line learner? Because it's quite difficult lines to learn from the Doctor Who. I was, but am I allowed to tell this yes, story? Sure. Don't think about it. Oh, well, I love my John, and I always read. Well, he had a problem with a few lines here and there. So, I would wear them. <laughs> so, I'd have something written there, and something written there. And we'd have, we'd have things written on the floor, which was always a problem when they got the dry ice out. Because we'd be going, right, John, four, 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 four. <laughs> And then suddenly, you know, I'd get carried away in a scene, and, and he'd be sort of saying, right, Joe, now what we have to do is take the polarity of it, and I'd close the tin with the writing in it. <laughs> and his eyes would be like, you know, and oh. <laughs> and then, so, you know, I'd stand there like this, so he could sort of see what was written on my hand. Um, and then occasionally he'd put, you know, reverse the polarity to the neutral effect. He, he would put that to music, so we'd sing it just before we did it. Reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. <laughs> and he got that. <laughs> um, so, I, no, I was good at lines because I couldn't see. You're talking about the fact that we could, did, did you, you're short sighted at the moment. Yeah, but I've got half strength lenses in now and I still can't see your face properly. Well, that could be a bonus for you. So, <laughs> I know you well, I mean, I know how to drop something on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's never happened before in the real world. We've had Star Wars, we've had John Luke Dada. Yeah, you've had the class act, right? Now I'm here. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I can't remember. I've got, I've got, I've got, I've got red. Yeah. <laughs> you can see, see, I've got yeah. quite red too. So it, it actually struck me through that that 
I honestly couldn't see anything. Yeah. Um, and I, I, as I say, this is me with lenses. You can imagine what it's like. And they, did, they didn't have lenses then. And, um, which is why John always used to stand at the edge of a cliff with a broom with a big white piece of cloth on it. Because he said, if, if I'm not standing here ready to... Or, or do, you know, we do yeah. this. He said, should we over that cliff? Should just carry on acting? <laughs> <laughs> um, and you notice I fall over and everybody just grabs me. Come on. You know, and lots of hand-holding, um, you know, to get me through. In a, in a strange way, it was kind of helpful because everything was in my imagination, as it still is to this day. You know, I can really play about it. But, you know, I see things in my head and, and I never saw the cameraman, you know, drinking a cup of tea, or... It was all so real to me, you know, it, it really was. And was it later on when um, sort of Jennifer Tom Baker era, we associate that with a lot of complaints coming through about sort of what they saw as being violence and what you could and couldn't show on screen. Was that a thing at this time, or was it not really a problem at this point? No, no, we just blew up churches, and uh, <laughs> that went down well. Um, but also, you know, when you look at things like, um, what was the one in the prison called? Mind of, Mind of Evil. Mind of Evil. I mean, that was pretty damn violent, wasn't it? And even in the Terribly Autons. So the, so the you've got policemen like ripping yeah. off their faces, and you've got, you know... Um, Back then, when people were selling products, they'd come to the door with like a free daffodil, you know, and kids are suddenly frightened of policemen. Anyone comes to the door with a daffodil, they say, don't put a bolt on! You know? And then like, those blow-up chairs were very trendy and fashionable, so suddenly they weren't being bought, you know, because they eat people. Um, and then the troll doll. Which, I mean, this was for children. Um, so, you know, I, I don't... Barry was very, very careful, but at the same time, we didn't have that no guns, no shooting, etc., etc. So did they manage to keep things kind of under wraps in the sense, like, for example, having the frontier of space being then sort of leading into the Dalek story, which people wouldn't have known was Dalek? Was all that stuff completely a surprise week on week? Or yes. Sort of, but now when people yeah. are sort of, you know, writing the internet. No, no, no. You, the great thing which, you know, I'm not saying anything's better or worse, you, you know, one goes with the times and embraces, you know, oh, well, I won't go into that, maybe I don't embrace as much as I'm seeing now. No, anyway, we won't get there. Um, that's another side. Um, but, you know, you, you, you waited a whole week, and there was nothing you could see in between. You know, you just had to wait very excitedly for that next well, episode. Actually, Patrick didn't like the cliffhangers from two of his face. He felt they were very poor cliffhangers, but, but most people were pretty excited. I kind of agree. I had a, a Frontier in Space is not my favourite, shall I say that? So um, I kind but of. But Samson turning into a villain, not working, Patrick, I'm afraid. <laughs> Being supported by the bosses. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it, it, I think it was overly long, and what had happened there, a lot more things had been planned which couldn't be carried out due, right. due to budget. Because they, they originally wanted to make it a big kind of 12-part kind of epic, didn't they, I think? Oh, and not even there. make it in London, they, uh, in England. I think, I think oh, really? they wanted to make it in Spain or something. I mean, it was a, it was a first-time attempt, and yes, they wanted a much bigger epic <coughs> outfit, and so many things just didn't pan out. You know, John Pertwee, um, obviously Richard and John, but those, those three, and working with somebody like Barry Letts, who... As I say, I think I say it on the, this thing is when, you know, we were all very, very concerned about the planet then. You yeah. know, I'd started in the late 60s being very concerned, not in the way that we are now, but certainly knowing that we were not looking at the consequences and we still had, and we hadn't even got into the, to, uh, technology. There's a real sense of, you know, sort of an ecological awareness. There's also the fact, you know, what the doctor's saying at the end about, you know, sort of you know, having a peaceful solution, not boasting about war. I, I was going to say, every single one, you know, people forget, we're getting the messages that are coming out today, but we've been trained to expect them through social media and so on and so forth. Back then, there was messages in absolutely every episode series we did. There was something that was being but said. Do you think the jungle stuff was a little <coughs> bit on oh, yeah. war yeah. as well? Yeah. That, that we, we've talked about. And, and Barry Letts was... Deeply, deeply concerned about the planet, 
um, and when the Green Death came. And he, you know, and finally, um, Terence Dick said to him, you know, well, Bally, you know, if you're really, really <laughs> so concerned about the planet, I really think you should write a script. It's almost like you were here with us. <laughs> discussing this with any of the production crew or the writers or anything like that? Um, John and I were very, very lucky in the fact that we were allowed to, you know, work with anything that we didn't feel was right. Um, you know, certain escapes where we went, no, I don't think so, and, you know, we'd, we'd all work, but we all worked together on that. Um, it was interesting, because I was growing up, if you know what I mean, I was suddenly learning a lot more about life and things for John and so on and so forth. But I did put my foot down when they started to cross-hatch me with Joe. Because back then, I know this is going to sound awful and I'm really embarrassed to say it, but like things were groovy and like far out and like money was like bread. You know, well like everybody has a language now. And I, you know, and they started to write that into Joe, and I went, there is no way I'm going to go to another planet and say, wow, what a groovy, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, I think sometimes that does happen, um, that you kind of lose the actor yeah. and the character. And I, was very, I, I felt very strongly that Joe could always maintain a little bit of humor with the Doctor, and that, uh, you know, she she was also feisty, and she had a go at anything, that girl. And I think it was lovely, too, that they gave her the opportunity to offer her life for the doctors. I think that was a first, um, because that's how important, you know. So we had little things that you just felt made the character, little tiny touches you, you'd bring in. Like, there were a lot of things that weren't scripted. You know, little looks and little reactions and things like that. And they trusted it. You know, when I did, I think this one, I do all this stuff on a, what did they call those old things? Tape recorder. Um, oh, listen to me, I'm so with it, aren't I? There's everything, you know, the tape recorder. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of that. Yeah, of the audience don't even know what a tape recorder is. <laughs> well, darling, it's a little thing that spools and kind of goes around like that. But they're out of date now. Uh, and so I improvised quite a bit of that talking, and they said, oh, she can do it. You know, um, so we did have input into making sure that our characters never went too far out of where they should, and also finding little things that you could see the differences as Joe got older, little things changed, and I, I, that was always very important too. Another question lined up, the, you're definitely going to see this, but it's right at the very, very back. <laughs> no, I've just listened. Yeah. Hi Katie, um, what was your memories of working on Men at the Top? and your relationship with the leading actor on that show? Your memories of Men at the Top? Oh, Man at the Top! Man I thought top. I your, heard menace at the top. Your relationship with the leading actor on that show? He liked football. <laughs> <laughs> I like football. Um, wonderful actor, but not the easiest actor to work with. Which actor are we talking about? We're talking about Kenneth Hay. Right. Wonderful, wonderful actor. And it was a groundbreaking serious. Um, and a lot of women were madly in love with Kenneth Hay. 
So I'd walk down the street and everyone would say, oh, you're so <laughs> lucky, you know. You um, <laughs> I'm not going there. <laughs> but, you know, that was that was because I was taken out of, I had, like, I was so excited because I didn't do school school, if you know what I mean, but I was very lucky. I, I learned important things like how to write poetry, paint, and speak French. You know, important things. Um, and... I could speak French, and so I got picked to play a very small part as a French au pair girl. Um, within a week, I was given a juvie, <coughs> and another one written for me. So, is that what you wanted, or did you want something I'm not going to tell you? Something you did not going to tell me. Because <laughs> I just heard that it was quite difficult. I got a lot of me. those done. Okay. <laughs> um, there's, there's a question over there, and on the side over there. All right, you on the side over there. There's a gentleman with a very fine kind of um, turquoise shirt and a black tie, and the next to you. You're also Has it got frills on it? Uh, no, that's back. the guy next to me. That's my best man. Okay, I know who that is. And then you're also bow tied as well. I got so many friends out here. I just have to tell you the wonderful thing about fans. Look at, I just have to say this: is so many have become my buddies. It's such a wonderful world to be in. You know, and it's the most important part of Doctor Who is the fans because without them, we ain't got nothing. I hear better at the end. Fair enough. <laughs> Don't fall off, will you? <laughs> so the other day, I for the first time watched Why on Earth is Casey Manning because you. Very quickly, um, I was a Sunday. I'm sitting with, um, I've told this story before, so somebody, but I'm sitting at, 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 with Binbag and Oscar, the dogs, and um, just watching TV, and the phone rings, and it's Gary Russell, and he says, darling, don't tell anyone. What? <laughs> I looked at Binbag, and he went, <laughs> Oscar said, <laughs> um, anyway, and so uh, that was that, and, you know. And then he said, call your agent. I said, don't tell what. And he said, call your agent tomorrow. So I called my agent and I said, um, hey, Peter, um, Gary Russell rang me yesterday and he said, I'm not to tell anybody, but I don't know what, I can't tell anybody because he didn't tell me what I couldn't tell. <laughs> and he said, I said, so what is it? He said, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of discussion? No. Um, and then, but two days later, I'm walking, um, towards a theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue, but I couldn't remember where this is. I've just come back from, sort of back from Australia, I haven't been back long. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, which theatre is that? And I'm walking along, and uh, the phone rang, and I, hello, and they said, hello darling, it's Russell. And I went, Russell? Russell, Russell who? And he said, Russell T. Davis. I went, oh darling, you know, how lovely, you know, brother. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to find a theatre. He said, oh, I'll Google it for you. So he's in L.A. Googling me to theatre. <laughs> I'm not confused. I don't think, oh, I wonder why Russell T. Davis has phoned me and is Googling me to the theatre. I didn't think cross my stupid mind, did it? And then he said, well, I'm so glad that you can do it. I went, do what? <laughs> and he said... Well, you know, he said, first of all, we're thrilled you're back from Australia because it makes it cheaper. And <laughs> I love the BBC. Um, and, you know, he said, but we, it, he said, it's something that I just so want to do and I'm so happy and it's going to be so... And then I realised, and he said, I'd like you to come back and play Joe Jones. And it never crossed my mind in a trillion, zillion, zillion years that I would come back and be in the show, and to be in it with Liz. You know, I have to say, that, in terms of my memories of doing events on the stage, that is probably one of my happiest memories, is mem um, having you and Liz on the stage with Matt Edward, I think, was on yeah. the stage as well, and I think uh, was probably that? Gary yeah. and um, um, Brian Minchin, I think, maybe, but it was a, it was a group anyway. You didn't <laughs> see Liz and I creep out, though, did you? <laughs> Well, you know when HD came and everybody gets so excited, I don't know why people bother bothered to fiddle about with tellies, all this, you know, surround sound and glue. I can't tell the difference. <laughs> but I can tell the difference on HD, right? And I looked at this, I said, Jesus, it's bad enough coming back as an old 
the old woman. And I said, now I got it. I said, even youngsters don't look that great in HD. You can see all the pits and zits, and I don't want to see that on my television. Anyway, so listen, I can't do it. I can't handle that either. So as the lights went down, <laughs> as the lights came up again, we've got um, time for a few more. I think there's one lined up. We shall get through from Central Block before. Oh, hi there, Katie. Uh, just had one question.